very inspiring uh, speaker for the day, Professor K. Vijay Raghavan, who will be in conversation with Krishnan Narayanan. And uh, Professor K. Vijay Raghavan was appointed the principal scientific advisor to the government of India in March 2018. And he has also served as the Secretary Department of Biotechnology Government of India. And Professor Vijay Raghavan's contributions in science as developmental biologist have been recognized widely. He was conferred an honorary Doctor of Science degree by the University of Edinburgh in 2011. And he's the J.C. Bose Fellow of the Department of Science and Technologies. As distinguished alumnus of IIT Kanpur, he's also a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy and the Indian Academy of Sciences and served on the council of the latter. Uh, with the IIT Kanpur, he's uh, worked on to develop their program in biosciences and bioengineering. And uh, this has rapidly developed into a leading biology center today. He's also on the board of uh, many institute of science and technology. And in conversation with Professor Vijay Raghavan is our own Krishna Narayanan, who is a co-founder and president of Itihasa Research and Digital. And he has chronicled the history of Indian IT in India and published reports on AI and brain research landscapes in India. Krishna Narayanan is also the vice president of IIT Madras Alumni Association. And uh, we're looking forward for a great session. So, Professor Vijay Raghavan, a, a very warm welcome to Sangam 2020, Driving the New Normal. I thank you and your office for the tremendous support provided for Sangam, both for the survey and the innovation showcase. So let's, uh, let's get uh, started with the questions for today. You know, let's go back in time, sir. It's the end of Jan 2020. The first COVID-19 case has been detected in India. Sort of give us an insider's view of how the science and medical establishments in the country swung into action to, to sort of formulate a, a plan of action for the pandemic response and some of the key learnings along the way. You know, um, the very um, valuable situation we have in our country is our health system, um, even though it's criticized often, has an extraordinary reach. It has a reach to every level, every single village, through the district health centers, through the integrated disease surveillance program, through the Anganwadi and the ASHA workers. So one has a mechanism of awareness of what goes on. Secondly, over many years, we have also had a reporting structure which reports any untoward illness. So for example, if there's an unusual pneumonia or a person having symptoms which cannot be attributed to something which is already there, then there's a reporting structure. And this reporting structure is integrated into the global reporting structure. Now, what happened, we must keep in mind with the SARS coronavirus 2 is something which is important and uh, stresses the value of this reporting structure. When the first instance of a person with unusual pneumonia was identified in China. It took some time for them to wrap their heads around it and communicate it well to the rest of the world. There is much debate on whether that should have been done faster or better and so on. That's a different topic. But late January, the WHO issued an advisory of concern which is sufficient for the Indian system to get activated. And we were amongst the first countries to put restrictions on people coming in because we know that it was because of people coming in that you know, we would be um, affected. The challenge is the system responded very well there. So our restrictions on that was good. People were isolated and people with symptoms were you know, checked and treated and so on. There were two challenges there. One, Tests were not available at that time to specifically identify people with SARS coronavirus 2 infections as distinct from those who had similar kinds of symptoms. Secondly, because of those tests not being available at that time, people were isolated on the basis of symptoms. They were quarantined, but if they didn't develop symptoms, they were allowed to go after quarantine. Whereas those who, of course, had symptoms had to be attended to. We knew only a little later that people without symptoms can transmit. 
and we only later had proper tests. So that was an early period, but there are lessons for other pandemics and epidemics on how to deal with them when we don't have tests. Right. So, you know, of course, now the COVID vaccines are around the corner, right? And, and in the public, there, there seems to be a mix of emotions all at the same time now. There's excitement about its availability. There's, there's a bit of caution, you know, and sort of new techniques, long-term effects. There's also a sort of sense of responsibility weighing in about the logistics challenges, etc. So how are you feeling? What are your thoughts about the COVID-19 vaccination in India? Well, first of all, India has got an extraordinary history of successful vaccinations. I remember growing up, um, and it's also a reflection on my age, of someone coming home with a you know, primer stuff, sterilizing needles, getting the vaccine, putting the sterile you know, ring and administering smallpox vaccine to everyone and documenting everything on a book. And you had these, you know, people of a certain age also have on their arm these large patches, which are those are smallpox vaccines. So India was extraordinary in, you know, putting forth vaccines which completely transformed our society and our health system. At that time, you know, for the smallpox vaccines or other vaccinations at that time, we just administered them. We didn't have this discussion, is it good, is it bad, is it necessary, is it not? It was a case of, you know, elites talking to everyone else, saying this is good for you. Today, the world has changed. Today, everyone discusses and rightly discusses and debates everything. That's as it should be. But it's all the more reason, therefore, for us people in great places like IIT Madras and other institutions to communicate the nuances of vaccine administration and vaccination. Vaccines are administered to healthy people. Therefore, the demand for trials and safety are enormous. It's not being administered to a person at a terminal stage of a cancer where one can gamble and say, well, even though the medication is risky, its benefits are high, so let's just go for it. Here, the risks have to be low and the value high. And indeed, they're always there. When you do vaccine trials, therefore, you divide into two groups, the uh, group where you administer the vaccine and a placebo group, and you look after both well. And there are multiple phases in the trial. First, you have a trial for safety, then immunogenicity, does the vaccine elicit an immune response, and then whether it is effective, and these overlap. So, a vaccine which is administered has to be safe, have an immune response, which is suggests that it can deal with the infection and must actually then be effective in the field. And indeed, I think all the vaccines which are being, which are in late phase trials are subject to very stringent tests. Right. So I think there is a sense of uh, optimism, which is rightfully being felt. Well, one must be very optimistic because typically vaccines take 10 years to develop and this has been done in one year. So it's a huge amount of investment, but the investment has, doesn't mean shortcuts. The investment comes by allowing what could otherwise have gone in series to now go in parallel. And that's, that's a, you know, you stockpile and you manufacture while the trials are going on. But supposing the trials fail, that whole stockpile has to be right. dumped. So, you know, those are the kinds of things which you do. Correct. In fact, that's a nice segue to my next question, which was really, uh, you know, about how this pandemic, what, what it has taught us about global collaborations, you know, whether it's in vaccine development, the uh, access to COVID-19 tools, accelerate the ACT accelerator, or perhaps even the collaboration among PSAs around the world. Yeah, no, that's been, um, you know, incredibly valuable. One of the important features of science across every discipline is the naturalness and the ease by which knowledge and discovery are shared. You know, uh, you call up any scientist anywhere in the world and they'll talk to you about anything they're doing. When science then goes to the technology interface of applications, even technology engineers share, of course, 
But when you go to the market and go to companies, there are you know other issues which come up. What happened during the pandemic is even there, the primacy was about public good and intellectual property and making a profit were you know way down the line. So not only did scientists globally share information, but industry across India shared information extraordinarily well. And many industries across the world put their you know, documentation um, openly available. So this resulted in the ability for rapid developments of products, particularly for testing, for you know, treatment of various kinds, less so for vaccine development and drug development because they are more later stage processes. Now, so sort of looking forward, I mean, actually you, you wrote in an article uh, on August 15th on the subject of envisioning a, a self-reliant and science-driven India. You, you said we must focus on the environment, biodiversity and sustainable development through Atma Vishwas and Atma Nirbharata. Can you explain, can you elaborate on this thought? Well, you know, you guys are all engineers and scientists. And basically what we have done over the past several industrial revolutions is defined a system and said that we want to have low entropy in the system. We want to have order, you know, cleanliness, high standard of living, uh, access, accessible to you know, consumer goods and all sorts of things. And we want to look after the environment really well inside the space and so on. Well, this is all very much possible, except that the space outside, you mess up. You don't get this for free. You need energy. And what is that? You exploit natural resources. You exploit other workers. You exploit the environment. Uh, you, you know... Uh, cause climate change. So all of that you can do if you, you do while creating this bubble. Now, by definition, if you want the whole world to be like this bubble, it poses a big problem in thermodynamics. How can you have, you know, high standards of living, order, peace and harmony uh, for everyone, not just for a small group, and yet not affect the environment? Now, that is the current challenge. If you have the luxury of affecting the environment and the climate and the world around you, uh, not over-exploiting resources, you could do that. Now, that's not tenable anymore. The world is at a precipice. Now, the solution for that is the following. So the solution comes from our ability today to harness the sun in multiple ways uh, or nuclear power, and both you know, in direct or indirect ways are a solution to availability of energy. Each of them have their challenges, their problems and so on. But basically the availability of energy at less and less damage to the environment is a great plus. Then people in the electronics industry and scientists, technologists, people like you have done wonders in changing the power transistor. You know, the earlier 15, 20 years back, the your you know, charger for your phone or other devices was the size of a brick. Today, it's the small. And that's because the, you know, there's a revolution in electrical electronics engineering. And therefore, powering of small motors uh, through, you know, pioneered by Ashok Junjunwala and colleagues, um, has allowed the use of DC power to drive a variety of kinds of appliances and, and motors and so on and so forth. So availability of energy and availability of tools for making things with low um, you know, uh, energy. And thirdly, communication. These three allow you know, dramatic change in the way the world can be. So earlier it was difficult to have small is beautiful, except in an idyllic village, which is uncollect, unconnected to the you know, speed and tempo of the world. With energy and this power situation available, we can now do that much, much better. And that is the big challenge. In fact, uh, Satish Pai, uh, one of the other speakers, 
has uh, you know spoke about this sort of this pathway to this, this, this alternate energy and so on now interestingly in the respondents to our survey you know they picked up three top prior technology priorities for india so they said information technology agriculture technology and environmental technology so tech for energy water and air so that's a it's a nice sort of uh, alignment there uh, uh, sir i wanted to get your perspectives on two technology priorities uh, for india uh, one is the quantum technology mission yeah let me um tell you um about the quantum technology uh, mission uh, and what it means uh, going ahead uh what is the um you know goal of that mission um and where how why is it relevant to india you mentioned earlier though uh you know important areas such as agriculture water and so on so india is unusual that it's been talking about those kinds of very critical rooted problems and simultaneously dealing with frontier technologies and science such as the um quantum approach to uh, computers and memory and so on and so forth so fundamentally what's happened is that in the last few years an iit madras has been a very important player in this environment both in terms of uh, conventional tools of cyber security uh, both hardware and software and in terms of quantum uh, computing quantum computers and post quantum uh, security uh, and so on and so forth. now what's going to happen is the following and we don't know when it will happen right now it's very early stage and the world is divided into two camps one which uh, basically poops the rise of quantum computing and quantum computers as too far away to be meaningful and the others who say that this is going to be the future which is entirely transformative in other words we're going from the kinds of computers we have today where you know the uh, flip flops are between 0 and 1 to having a much more uh, flexible larger number of quantum states and therefore storage and computational ability becomes phenomenally available the question clearly is can we have solve problems which conventional computers cannot do and only quantum computers can do then quantum computers start becoming valuable for their current cost and difficulty in manufacture so what we have done is we have embarked on a major quantum mission the finance minister made an announcement for 8000 crores so it's not just for making a quantum computer or for quantum computing those are the end goals or important goals but it also looks at a broader view of all quantum matters as such and therefore we'll have a major thrust in areas such as laser photonics we already by the way keep in mind that the conventional engineering and science system which we all depend on so much our electronics um our semiconductors they're all based on quantum phenomena so it's not that it's something weird and new which is coming but this is something which is going to be very important uh, as we go ahead and you know i was very impressed when we had a series of meetings on this over the last year and a half that there are about 20 or 25 institutions in india where there are young bright people who are really experts in these matters there are of course you know two or three places where there's extraordinary high quality experimental investment and they will take the lead um you know these are typically the tata institute of fundamental research in mumbai the indian institute of science and there's a major group at iit madras uh, so these are the kinds of places which will take the need lead and be the hubs which will you know uh, develop the spokes uh, all over the country right that's fascinating to hear now yeah, i i know your office also recently launched the kisan mitra platform you know keeping in mind the agriculture so can you can you talk 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 a little bit about that you know um i must acknowledge um the contribution of the iit madras alumni association and dr sapna poti um who the alumni association has got uh, and you know i had a discussion with the director and the alumni association people uh, about whether you know in this very trying year uh, we could have sapna looking at uh, issues which are of national interest and not just of interest to iit madras and and she has been you know uh, 
really a, a force of nature and worked with um, the Agricultural Ministry, the Indian Council for Agricultural Research, the Krishi Vigyan Kendras, uh, you know, the CSIR, uh, and developed both the Kisan Mitra and the Atmanirbhar app. Basically, every aspect of the Kisan's life, which is seed, water, soil, market, and weather, these information for every kind of crop can you know, be analyzed, looked at, and fed back to the Kisan. So this is an incredible uh, you know, portal, which will keep getting stronger and stronger. We will formally hand it over to the agriculture ministry, but we will, the PSA's office will be closely involved in ensuring that this partnership continues and keeps improving. So this is going to be very, very important. Then the Atmanirbhar Kisan app is another very important app which allows you know, all of this to be integrated, connected through API and other ways to other apps, and therefore it's much easier for the Kisan to handle. These two are very, very important areas in agriculture. Right, great. Now, you, you, uh, earlier you were talking about the benefit versus risks of vaccines and so on. Now, in our survey, we did ask people about the, their perceptions of benefit versus risks for emerging technologies. And here is what we found. So the they respondents very strongly believe that benefits outweigh risks for technologies like renewable energy. So the net score was 87%. Electric vehicles was like 76%. Next set came, next set were nanotechnology and artificial intelligence. And technologies like cryptocurrency, synthetic virology, and gene editing actually scored negative. Now, what is your reaction? Uh, is, is, does this mean there is a need for further education or better articulation of benefits versus risks? So, you know, um, if you had asked me this um, a few years ago, I would have been much more hectoring and saying, you know, people need to understand more, this is fine, and this is the safety regulations in place and so on. I think that kind of a top-down hectoring approach is not correct. Um, conversely, a bottom-up approach that anything new is dangerous is, of course, also not correct. The question is, why are technologies difficult to adopt? Uh, and why are other technologies very easy to adopt? Even though uh, you know, the ones which are adopted may be far more dangerous uh, in the way they are used than the ones which are not adopted. Uh, to use a cell phone while crossing a road or driving a car is one of the most dangerous things, but people will do that, but they will not do something um, very simple, which they perceive as dangerous um, even though it is not dangerous, you know. So um, there are issues there. One of the people who wrote very extensively, this has been much analyzed, and one of the people who wrote extensively about this is a person who sadly passed away last year, Celestis Juma in Africa. And he analyzed in Africa and all over the world why technologies are adopted and why they are not. And the principal problem is not just the risk benefit, but the timing of the benefit compared to the risk. If you get instant gratification, you tend to adopt many things which are very, very risky. You know, uh, smoking, for example. Uh, uh, and therefore, and it takes a long time to convince people that they're dangerous. But if the gratification is in the future or saving the planet, or if it is something which makes a problem go away, so that you don't see the problem every day there and every day disappearing. So vaccination, for example, removes the presence of a disease largely or very effectively. Then you say, why should I get vaccinated? But all of us are alive today because we got a whole bunch of childhood vaccinations. You know, at, at independence, our lifespan was in the 30s and in no small measure, I mean, nutrition, of course, played a role, but infectious disease played an enormous role. So the luxury of the elite to say what one doesn't need after having used all those which you say you don't need is, you know, 
I would some years ago have dismissed it, but I would say, okay, it doesn't matter. Let's listen and let's see why we can and how we can make people adopt these things more. Um, in some, I would like to say that it's okay. You know, you don't want to adopt a technology, don't do it if it is something you can do without. But if it is something for large community benefit, then you know, think about it very carefully. Right. And in fact, sort of continuing on, on a similar vein, you know, 91% of the respondents in our survey believe that scientists and technologists should discuss more with the public about the social and ethical implications of their work. Now, and then especially in the context of AI, there is a lot of talk today about responsible AI, transparency, et cetera. What's your perspective on this, sir? Um, you know, AI is going to be a very interesting challenge um, not only, you know, in elite societies, uh, elite heavy societies or societies which are much richer, but also in societies uh, such as ours. For thousands of years, knowledge has meant power. And those without knowledge have been powerless. When the printing press came, those who could get books were powerful and those who didn't were told what to do and what is good for them. So today's analog of the printing press is, you know, the internet and, um, you know, tools such as AI and deep learning um, and machine learning. Through them, without a deep understanding of a particular area, soon, because of the ability to handle large volumes of data well and fast, People would be given advice on what they should do in their daily lives. And this would be good advice. This would not be just to the farmer and to the shopkeeper, but it will also be to individuals telling them that this choice in your career is good for you. Uh, this choice is bad. So these are, you know, the astrologers of the future. And, you know, one of the key points about astrology is not that it can predict what happens to you but the astrologer usually used to be someone very close to your family so is more a counselor than a predictor so the ai becomes a extraordinary counselor at an individual level now as never never before so what do you do what happens to you and to your ability to take decisions on your own when you're getting good advice from a machine right and this is a very important ethical moral and social issue. Now here, what is the answer to that? The answer to that, I think, lies in grass, what you know, some really innovative alums of yours have been doing, like Sridhar Vembu with Zoho, is to make sure that the tools and the understanding required, that is the tools of statistics, computer science, you know, various other ways of handling data, are available to everyone. In other words, you know, when I get advice on, a, on an AI-based advice, I should have a, an understanding of how that comes to me, but also have the ability in my own circle, in my own bubble, to create tools which can, you know, look and give that, that community advice in a very different kind of perspective. So the world has changed in the last few hundred years. We are increasingly going to have prosthetics such as phones and AI tools and so on as part of us. That should not move into a situation where decision making is by these prosthetics and not by us. And that's a big, big challenge, but we have to go ahead. And right. So, and uh, uh, Professor, the last question, uh, you know, any message to the, the young students and the young alumni of, uh, of IIT Madras? <laughs> you know, uh, the world seems uh, very different this year than at the end of last year. But really, it has also brought out a much more human uh, way encompassing all of humanity of looking at our futures. Uh, it's not just about making a living, which is very, very important but it's about making a living in a manner which impacts on the lives of many others in beneficial ways. 
and you know goes forward particularly you know india has an enormous responsibility in that with a very large young population we have a responsibility for the world and not just for us uh, over several decades iit madras has been absolutely extraordinary in the way it's had impact all over the world today my feeling is that it can have an enormous impact in india and in the world because of the dominance of design as upstream of all the other points we talked about you know energy motors and so on and so forth design is is the key and design is the exportable value in any company in any group so i would urge no matter whether you're making shoelaces or making a spacecraft focus on design and get the quality of design done and then go on to the making and then you will be not only impactful but also rich and famous <laughs> thank you thank you for that uh, wonderful message thank you yeah and it's been a really wonderful um, conversation thank you uh, professor vijay raghavan